Hawaiian children represent the whole color palette. And I think when we focus on improving that, because Hawaiians have always scored for the last 70 something years towards the bottom of the pot. And if we pay attention to improving that, so do we raise everybody else. So I don't think it's about focusing on one. I really think that it's looking at that as a huge opportunity to impact the broader of education for all children in Hawaii. In 1983, a comprehensive assessment on the educational needs for Native Hawaiians was completed. The results found that Native Hawaiians were scoring below national norms on standardized achievement tests, were overrepresented in special education, and underrepresented in gifted and talented programs in both public and private schools and had educational needs that are directly correlated with their unique cultural situation. To address the findings of the assessment, Congress enacted the Native Hawaiian Education Act in 1988, which initially funded programs in five distinct areas. In 1994, the reauthorized Native Hawaiian Education Act established the Native Hawaiian Education Council to coordinate, assess, and report and make recommendations on the effectiveness of existing education programs for Native Hawaiians, the state of present Native Hawaiian education efforts, and improvements that may be made to existing programs, policies, and procedures to improve the educational attainment of Native Hawaiians. One of the milestones for the work at the council has been the advocacy and public policy work around the protection and use of our Hawaiian language as an official language of the state of Hawaii. Another milestone that the council was involved in was the support for passing the legislation that children are ready for kindergarten in either of Hawaii's two official languages. And that's a major point because it starts at the foundational preschool level in ensuring that we protect an endangered indigenous language. In terms of Nahonua Moliola, it really began where our communities were kind of coming into the fold. I think it was a voice that they had within them about wanting to do different things and different ways of fostering learning. And Nahonua Mauliola was a beginning expression of how to do that. Nahonua Mauliola is a set of 16 Hawaiian cultural guidelines with support strategies to assist learners, educators, families, schools and institutions and communities with a way to examine and attend to the educational and cultural well-being of all its learners. Every part of the book to me is awesome. Like we recommend that everybody who is licensed in the state of Hawaii have at least one semester of Hawaiian culture and language because they're teaching our kids. And but for me, I knew you had to do the strategies. Okay, I'm a classroom teacher, that's what I need. I want to go to a workshop and be able to use it tomorrow. We even took it to the National Indian Education Association Conference. They were fascinated that we finally would have a way to assess cultural learning. Our work in terms of the World Indigenous People's Conference on Education, the meeting of indigenous peoples around the world and groups around the world to focus at raising those bars of excellence for native education at an international level. And one of those areas, of course, is accreditation. And currently they have 
two accreditation processes. So that has been a really major piece. The NHEC has been uh, involved with WinHEC since its inception. Uluko is actually a perfect example of the kind of work that NHEC has been involved with. It began as a digital Hawaiian language dictionary. So one of the areas within Uluko has been our curriculum database. And that has been where we've been able to collect different curriculum that have been developed from Native Hawaiian education uh, grants. And all the different people from different communities have a place, a repository in which to access them in. And there's all kinds of science and social studies and different grade levels in Hawaiian and in English. But they all are very culture-based. That is one thing that is different. <laughs> If I were to say the thing that I think is the most important of our work from the beginning is that we have created and nurtured and fostered a broader voice for, for education that we didn't have prior. You know, it was much more top down of what we do in schools and trying to meet mandates that were set instead of trying to figure out how we work, all the strengths and talents we have in our community across education to impact education better. I think that's really an excellent piece of work. It has not been easy because we have to actually go back and take a temperature check on that. And we have to revitalize those things that made us strong at one time and figure out how to bring those timeless, important best practice back into the fold of education. So of course, Olelo has a big part in that. Culture has a big part in that. Place genealogy have a big part in that. And so the reason why I've stayed so long is because although membership has changed, everybody that has come has come to the table with a commitment to education. Moving forward, the Council's five-year strategic vision articulates tactics in three areas. Supporting the use of culture-based education strategies for student learning, growth, and achievement. Engaging with Native Hawaiian education stakeholders, including policy and advocacy work for the benefit of Native Hawaiian families and communities. Coordination of repositories and studies for culture-based curriculum, instruction, assessment, and evaluation work. On the face of the requirements, the, the words of coordinate, report, assess, make recommendations seem relatively passive and one-sided, but the work of the council is far from easy because it is an entity trying to coordinate people and systems and leaders that the council itself does not have any kind of power other than convening, other than bringing together. It requires a numerous amount of conversations, perspectives, and really numerous hours honoring and respecting the voices that come from families and communities about their desire to educate their children in the manner that they want to educate. And so while the work is difficult, the work is also extremely important to bring voice to communities or populations about value of Native Hawaiian education um, for voices that don't feel like they have a place at the table or a way to express those things are important to them as families. I think we're starting to see the value of this greater systemic work and being partners in that work. And, the, and that outcome is really about empowering our people. And education is one of those key strategies to do that. And the Native Hawaiian Education Council has been really critical to the conversation. It's really been a wonderful journey. I do feel like I'm making a difference. I'm able to be a part of what I see as a change happening. And I think that's really important, that this is really about positive change and about helping all of our students. And in particular, of course, our Native Hawaiian students succeed. And so for me, I get, I get a tremendous amount of satisfaction from that. <laughs>
This time that we're in where there's federal change, state change, seems almost like the perfect storm of change in Native Hawaiian education. And whenever there is something like the perfect storm, there's a tremendous amount of energy. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity for great things to happen. And there's also a tremendous amount of risk and, and perhaps danger because particularly in Native Hawaiian education work, there are voices that don't always agree and don't believe in the perspectives that Native Hawaiian education advocates believe in, and particularly from the voice of families and communities. And so while it is an exciting time uh, to be in, it's also a time of change. And we know that whenever there is change, uh, people react differently to change. Some excitedly embrace it. Others are fearful of the change feel very fortunate to be in the place where I am to be able to affect change, support it, and it is extremely fulfilling and extremely excited to be a part of a movement. And hopefully we'll look back on and say, yeah, we had an opportunity to make a difference in Native Hawaiian education. <laughs> Being that I taught Hawaiian language and Hawaiian culture for about 30 years, I knew I always knew culture-based ed is the only way to go. But what makes me excited is teaching these kids about the place where they come from and the beauty of the culture. These kids had a foundation in knowing who they were. And even if they were not Hawaiian, they became island people because of learning about the culture. I think culture-based educational strategies make teachers better teachers. They do much, much better for themselves as well as for their students. And it doesn't matter if they come from Texas or wherever, because we've had teachers tell us, you know, where I lived, where I grew up, I was never really like attached to my place. But since I've been here, I have a sense of place. This is my place, I belong here. We do Hawaiian culture-based training with brand new teachers in the DOE. And we also do some cultural work with the administrators in the DOE. And for all of them, it, it's an eye-opening thing about making sure you take care of the whole child and that's what Hawaiian culture-based education does. NHAC has been a total catalyst for place-based learning through culture-based education. We don't understand really the potential that a child has. I remember as a child uh, taking the IQ test. IQ tests were really big then. At kindergarten, I scored at the borderline of special ed. And the principal told my mother at that time that I could never amount to be much than maybe a good mother in the world needs good mothers. And where would I have been if I was tracked from kindergarten and that's where I was stuck for the rest of my life, never knowing the potential of my own possibilities. And it's the process of education's job to bring out the best and to strengthen the best in every child. And so I get up every morning and I do that work because our children deserve the best of what we have in our generation to move those paradigms forward because they cannot experience that same thing. And that's all part of that experience of being acculturated into another cu culture, that we don't quite honor and respect what children bring into the classroom. That's what we've been doing since the beginning of the NHEC, is to figure out those ways that we can engage to make things better in every single venue, down to assessment and accreditation and new innovations and different kinds of ways of teaching. And I stick with the NHEC because of that. I go to bed tired every night and I get up in the morning, I say, you gotta keep going because now I have grandchildren. It takes time to reshift and it doesn't happen by itself 
or by one nice curriculum or program. It really happens as a whole movement, as a community, as a Lahui movement for all of us here in Hawaii with our supporters from Washington and our babies in the classroom and those people in the tarot patch that are replanning our land, all of that contribute to a different quality of our life in Hawaii. And I think we've all worked towards that. That's what gets me up every morning. We would like to mahalo the many committed educators and community members who have served on the council without compensation for the past 20 years. We honor those who have passed and those who are no longer members of the council, but continue to serve diligently for the benefit of our Lahui. Without the individual and collective passion and perseverance of members past and present, the Council could not continue to fulfill the purposes of the Native Hawaiian Education Act and its vision to enrich the well-being of Hawaii's keiki.